Hello everyone, I'm here with Joshua Collins running against Denny Heck in the 10th Congressional District of Washington State. Joshua, thank you so much for coming on the program. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mike. How's it going? Yeah, it's going great. I know that you're a truck driver, so you're traveling the country. Yeah. You're just an ordinary person who's choosing to run for Congress. What made you want to yeah. run? Uh, well, a number of things. Um, the biggest thing is just in my district, uh, we are one of the most progressive and safe blue districts in the country. And we have a representative who uh, just won't budge on pretty much anything. He's a conservative Democrat and, you know, he won't support Medicare for all ever. He already said he'll never support it. Um, he won't sign on to the Green New Deal. Uh, and just the giant issues that we're facing in this country um, are too important and too uh, and we're in too much of a crisis to have someone who's not going to actually uh, help with any of it. Yeah, we've actually been following Denny Heck for quite some time on this show. Um, back when he was asked at a town hall whether or not he'd support Medicare for All, and he very bluntly said no. So I've kind of yeah. watched this district for a while. I brought on Tambourine Borelli, who ran against him as an independent in 2018, and now we're interviewing you. So I really hope that... Um, you're successful here because we've all been watching this district and Denny Heck is really one of the worst Democrats. Like, I don't think it's hyperbolic to say that he's extremely concerned right. if he takes corporate money and he doesn't represent the people of that district who, as you said, are incredibly progressive. So let me ask you this. There is a lot of candidates running in 2020. What sets you apart from other progressives? What are some key policy issues that you really will go into Congress fighting for guns blazing? Uh, well, some of our biggest uh, policy issues, I mean, I, I guess we have a lot of them because uh, we are pushing the Overton window with almost every issue. Um, when it comes to marijuana, um, you know, we don't just believe in legalizing it. We don't just believe in, you know, expunging the records of people who have been convicted of marijuana offenses. We also believe in paying reparations to people who have spent years or sometimes decades of their lives in prison. Um and that is so important to us uh, because, you know, this government has stolen lives from people. That is, you know, relationships ruined, people's careers ruined. And that is, you know, trauma that they will never recover from. And I think it is only fair that the government pays for what it has done to these people and their families. Yeah, that's actually really interesting. I hadn't thought about that previously. And my, you know, sense of what reparations should be given out has kind of broadened. Like I'm definitely on board with mm -hmm. reparations for American descendants of slavery. I don't know how you feel about yes. that as well. Awesome. I, yeah, I um I support um, reparations for descendants of slaves and indigenous people, both structural and financial. Um, whatever we can get done, um, I I support it. That's great. Yeah. So so people like you and also Mike Gravel to an extent have broadened my view of, you know, who we should be paying reparations to, you know, be it victims of war, yeah. people who were victims of our drug war. I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so let me ask you about these things, because you are basically a very staunch progressive. But let's just go down the line here. I want to put you on the spot and ask you some very specific policy questions. And if you right. can give me a yes, no or a maybe on this, this will kind of give people yeah. really good sense as to what you stand for. So Medicare for all. all right. Yes. And I also believe in erasing all medical debt. That's great. That's really great. Student yeah. loan debt cancellation. Uh, I believe in free college. I believe in uh, giving stipends to students and canceling all student debt every single penny. That's great. Um, how about ranked choice voting? Uh, yes, I support ranked choice voting, um, automatic voter registration, et cetera. And yeah. what is your stance on legalizing psychedelics? Uh, I support legalizing psychedelics, um, same as uh, you know, many other uh, drugs that we should have legalized for both medical and recreational use. That's that's excellent. Um, how about uh, public financing of every single election across the country? Uh I support it fully. Um, I, uh, they have a really good system in Seattle, and I think we can copy that in the rest of the country, um, where they give you essentially a voucher where you can, um, you know, give it to whoever politician, whichever politician you want, and they use that and turn it in. They get a they get actual funding for it. So that's what I would like to um, reproduce across the country. That's great. That's great. Um, how about 
let's see here. I have a couple of different things, but I have it for Senate and um, House, so I need to make sure I get the right one. A uh, federal jobs guarantee. Yeah, I support a federal jobs guarantee. And that um, can be a combination of things um, between transitioning uh, people in the military from fighting in wars overseas to actually bringing them home and putting the work to work on our infrastructure and also uh, you know, getting people out and doing the work that is needed in this country to transition to green energy. And uh, you support a Green New Deal. Um, you support reparations yes. for people who um, were uh, locked up for marijuana possession and I'm assuming sales. So yes. yeah, this is great. I think that just looking at these types of policies, you really see that you are different than yeah. someone like Danny Heck. You're part of the new wave. You're an AOC type of Democrat. And I think this is really exciting right. for people. But a lot of people currently, they feel, and myself included to an extent, and I'm sure you as well, feel demoralized because it's really difficult to run a campaign against an incumbent Democrat because you are choosing to not take corporate money. So it's a disadvantage that you're accepting. But at the yeah. same time, it's important because you're one remaining principle and two, you're demonstrating to people that you're not going to be beholden to these large multinational corporations. You're right. going to be beholden to the people. So how do you run a successful campaign against someone like Denny Heck, who's backed by the establishment and you know financial interests when you definitely won't be able to raise as much money as him. So strategically, yeah. like what is your plan to beat him? The um, So of course, we're not going to raise a million and a half dollars. But right. based on what I looked at with uh, the other campaigns is you need about 10% to be competitive. Mm -hmm. So our our goal is realistically, we can actually raise about 300,000. Um, but if we have a hundred, if we have 150,000, I'm pretty sure we will win this. Wow. Um, so we, you know, we, and we are on track to do that. We just uh, announced um, like seven weeks ago and we're at over $20,000 already. And this is completely online. This is just people going onto my website and donating. We haven't held any fundraisers. We haven't sold any merchandise, anything like that. And we already hit 20 grand. Um, and I'm not a particularly well-connected person. So this is all just organic people going to my website and donating, which is um, you know, I think the new model where people, uh, go straight to you, they, they hear your message and they want to donate to you. Um, and if anyone watching does want to donate, it's at joshua2020.com. Um, and you can also sign up to volunteer and get updates as well. Um, as far as our strategy, our strategy is to build a coalition. Um, and that is, uh, you know, as, me as a truck driver, a blue collar worker, I don't have the same perspective as everyone. But I can bring people from other perspectives into the campaign as part of our campaign. And that means having a kitchen cabinet for every uh, you know, set of issues, whether it's LGBT rights, indigenous, issue, indigenous issues, um, you know, disability issues, et cetera. And that is uh, what we are doing and you know, making sure that everyone's uh, needs are addressed by this campaign. Because this isn't about me and who I am. This is about like, who I am going to represent. Um, and so far we've had a lot of success and a lot of it, um, goes to me, uh, you know, making a lot of noise on Twitter about these issues and, <laughs> and that has brought, um, uh, the attention of, you know, people all over the country onto our district, which is very difficult to do. So, you know, we are, um, getting people activated. We're also bringing a lot of young people into the process, people who were too young to even vote when Bernie Sanders ran for president. And, you know, we are activating people and, um, you know, I, the fact that we have uh, well over 300 volunteers signed up already, uh, I think, speaks volumes for you know how uh, far we can go. Um, you know, we're we're going to need a, a basically a small army to defeat Dennis Heck, um, and I think we're going to get there. Yeah, that's impressive. If you have 300 volunteers, that really is relatively large. Like it doesn't seem large in the grand scheme right. of things when we focus on like presidential campaigns, but for just someone running in a district who is grassroots funded, that really is impressive. So kudos to you. And I think that your Twitter game is helping, honestly, because I've already seen you dunk on Ben Shapiro. Um, you are calling out Democrats. And one thing that I really like is you've been incredibly vocal about the weakness of Democratic Party leadership. I know that you've talked a little mm -hmm. bit about Nancy Pelosi's unwillingness to uh, pursue an impeachment inquiry to Donald Trump. Yes. I find this infuriating. Um, so in the event you were elected, what would you do to help push? I mean, hopefully when you're elected, Trump will already mm -hmm. be out. But how would you just in terms of putting pressure on Democratic Party leadership, how would you get them to do what progressives want if you're also balancing out, you know, committee appointments and you're balancing out, you know, trying not to offend them to the extent where they can marginalize you in Congress. Like, 
What's the right way that you think you can hold people accountable in power, in leadership, and actually get them to listen? I think the most important thing is, first of all, having a large voice online to give myself a way to bypass uh, the media deciding what the narrative is. And that's why I'm putting so much effort into my Twitter account. Um, in It doesn't sound like a, a lot, but in six months, I went from 34 followers to 10,500. And that is just me tweeting and saying my views. I think that is an important part, but also uh, just make the entire conversation public. That way there isn't uh, any, any doubt on wh where people stand on this. Um, and part of that is bringing up like, who doesn't support something and who does on Twitter. But also if, uh, if someone is going to oppose incredibly popular uh, legislation like Medicare for All, for example, I'm going to go in their districts and hold town halls in their district, talk to their voters, let them know this is where your, your representative stands. If they don't like it, then I, I guess, I mean, that's democracy, right? You, if you actually talk to people and let them know where they stand, because th this is like their entire plan is to hide behind key issues where they are good, like LGBT issues, et cetera, um, and then just completely hide from the media, never talk about it, or uh, be very vague when they talk about things like Medicare for All, like uh, the Green New Deal, and, and just kind of waffle on it and be weak on it and just hide from it. So I, I think someone like me who has no problem making a lot of noise and actually uh, doing everything in the public arena is what it takes to actually get people to feel at least pressure to support stuff. Because, you know, I... I think these issues that we are facing, you know, climate change, we're facing an extinction level event. This is the actual apocalypse like coming for us. And we have politicians who are, uh, you know, too worried about the existence of the fossil fuel in industry and the profits of, you know, shareholders. Right. And then we also have Medicare for all 45,000 people dying every year. And they're too worried about the lives of the insurance companies rather than the people dying. Um, and so I think, you know, it, it's very clear where the people stand on this stuff. There's polling um, and it's and it's just obvious on its face that these are good for us. Um, and so that is that is my whole plan is just to make everything public and keep everything out in front where people can see it. Um, so we actually bring people into the conversation. And, and uh, yeah, that's that's the whole plan, essentially. Yeah, that actually is a great plan, because I think that if you kind of have your own like mini bully pulpit, then nobody yeah. wants to anger the person with like millions of twitter followers like aoc even if she's a target of the right wing like you can see that democrats mm -hmm. when they often take like shots at her it's anonymously in a political article so i think that kind of emulating yeah. that strategy that's a good strategy you know and it is a way to kind of move the needle in your direction and one thing that i find fascinating about candidates like you is that you're bringing in this new perspective you're younger so like people like yeah. you and i like when we're older we will witness possibly the end of you know the habitability of our planet if we don't take action so this is a serious issue right whereas people in congress you know it's mostly older people who don't really have to see the consequences play out i mean we're already seeing the consequences play out but they're not going to see the worst yes. of what climate change has to offer so i think that that is such a crucial thing that you're bringing you know in terms of the, just this perspective and also you know being a blue collar worker talk about you being a truck driver because um, if I'm a truck driver, I mean, I'm, I just wouldn't want to run for Congress in general. So maybe I'm just biased, but like, yeah. I feel like you're, you're going to be busy. You're traveling the world. So wanting to run for Congress would be like the last thing on my mind. So what is it about truck driving and being a blue collar worker that made you feel as if this is what you need to do? The biggest thing is France. What happened in France with the yellow vests, mm. um, they, we saw what happened when you have a liberal government try to, um, you know, transition to green energy without, uh, you know, inconveniencing the rich. And what that did was put the entire burden on the working class. And it was specifically in France, truck drivers who started um, getting in the streets because they were the ones getting screwed over. Interesting. And I don't want to see that happen in this country. I don't want to see, um, you know, a liberal government put all of the burden on the backs of truck drivers, and welders and nurses and teachers, rather than the extremely wealthy people who have most of the wealth in this country, um, who have profited off of things like, uh, you know, burning fossil fuels. Um, 
And so that that's my whole purpose is to actually make the point that like, if we don't address this and make sure that we are taxing the rich and that we are spending on our people and actually setting things up in a way that benefits the working class people in this country, they're going to do everything they can to put the burden on us. And I would like to oppose that. Now, as a truck driver driving all over the country, um, I've been to, all, to 48 states. The other two I uh, can't really get to with a, a truck. <laughs> um, but I've, uh, I, you know, I, I see right now automation is coming for us, right? And it's being celebrated like this really great thing. Um, meanwhile, you have truckers, you know, some of, you know, in, ranging anywhere, ranging anywhere from 20 to, uh, you know, 60, 70 years old, right? Out on this road, they have put, you know, years, in some cases, decades of their lives into this industry. They have put their bodies on the line. They have, you know, sacrificed their personal and family relationships to get people's freight uh, across the country. And then you have these companies like Tesla um, coming in and they just want to scoop up the entire industry and say, okay, forget about the truckers. Let's uh, now all of this, all of this money, all of these jobs that were existing, now all of that wealth is going to be funneled straight to Tesla, straight to Uber or whatever company automates the jobs away first. And that is something that I think is just fundamentally unfair. And that is what they want to do with most industries in this country. Um, you know, low level coders, you have, uh, you know, the entire customer service industry um, where, you know, companies are going to replace people with AI. And that just basically leaves millions of people with no plan, mostly high school, uh, high school educated people with no plan, no jobs, no, like no way to go forward. And I think it's important that we have that perspective going to Congress um, so that we don't have the same thing happen that happened with, uh, you know, the industrialization era where, you know, a, a single factory could do the work of, you know, like 10 factories and, you know, people were just left with no options. I think we need to address automation on the scale that it, it is necessary, the same as addressing climate change on the scale that is necessary, the same as addressing, uh, you know, the health and healthcare crisis on the scale that's necessary, the housing crisis, et cetera. Um, and that's, I guess that's my, my perspective as a, a trucker. No, and that's really interesting. Uh, I find that fascinating because automation is something, and particularly like with respect to truck driving, you know, this is an industry that could be automated away 10, 15 years. Um, so let me ask you this, in terms of dealing with something like automation, what type of approach would you favor, just broadly speaking? So, I mean, there's there's the universal basic income approach where, you know, once these jobs go away, we do UBI. Now, there's various ways you can implement UBI. You can do a UBI in lieu of social safety net programs, which I don't support, or you can do a UBI Same. in addition to social safety net programs. Or do you kind of agree with this more democratic socialist model where, you know, if automation is going to be the future, which it seems like that will be the case, we should be reaping the rewards of that, not these large multinational corporations. Like, what do you think just broadly, because this is a really loaded question, but what's your take yeah. on that in general? So I guess I'll start with the UBI. Um, it, I mean, I'm a fan of redistributing wealth back to the working class. Um, I am not happy with um, Andrew Yang's UBI as yeah. a truck driver, and I've talked to other truck drivers, they typically have the same sentiment. Um, the whole point of his idea, at least the way he's marketed it, it, it as being universal, it's something that addresses the needs of everyone. But he made it originally exclusionary of, you know, people who are um, unemployed, who are, uh, you know, elderly on Social Security, who have disability, etc. And um, that was, you know, problematic for most people. And they they addressed one uh, issue, which is Social Security. So mm -hmm. it no longer deducts from Social Security. But that means that they recognize that it was exclusionary, and they're still leaving everyone else out. Yeah. So it still deducts from, you know, your disability, etc. And that is why I don't support it. I don't think something a, a universal basic income that doesn't actually benefit the people who are struggling the most. I I don't think that's a really good way for this country to go. Because it's not truly um, universal in that sense, which is exactly. kind of my gripe with it as well. Right. If you just gave everyone, you know, a thousand dollars a month um, without any stipulations of it subtracts from your Social Security or your disability, et cetera, just or your unemployment, then I would be, you know, all in in support of it. Yeah. But ultimately, I think in this country, what we need to do 
is address the unfair dynamic between you know workers and their bosses, mm-hmm. right? And I don't think you can really get to the root of any of these problems without worker empowerment. Um, trucking is such a perfect example of this. We are pushed and pushed and pushed. And no matter how uh, big of a shortage of drivers there is, they don't want to increase pay. So they just want workers to work longer hours for lower wages. And that is why you see a truck driver making um, you know, $40,000 a year now where they were making that 20 years ago. Um, even though the, like, exactly. Um, and you know, nurses deal with the same stuff. Um, you know, welders deal with the same stuff. It's the entire country that's dealing with this. And I think that requires, um, you know, a a full scale, um, change in the culture of our country. Um, and it, it requires empowering unions, not just to continue, uh, maintaining at the level they are, but to actually reverse it and get on the level of countries like Sweden and Denmark. Um, you know, a lot of these countries we look at who have these, uh, you know, programs like, you know, single payer and great education system, et cetera. They also have a very robust uh, you know, union in, in unionization in those country. I think that's what we're missing partially. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to strengthen workers. And, and one way I would do that um, to get people to be more willing to strike against their workers and to stand up against companies like Amazon would be providing, um, you know, uh, unemployment benefits for striking workers. Um, it would be, you know, subsidizing union uh, dues to completely uh, wipe out the entire argument against uh, um, unionization that these right to work uh, uh, supporters have have created. That's a good idea. Um, and also provide the infrastructure and the administrative administrative um, support for newly forming forming unions, and that should be all from the government. And I think that would be a way to send um, a message to uh, you know the country and the people in this country that. Um, you know, here we're going to support workers. That's, we need to do that. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, really great yeah. ideas with the subsidizing union um, dues. I didn't really think about that, but I like how you're bringing all of these new ideas to the table. Like you're one candidate and you've gotten me to think about reparations for victims of, you know, marijuana being illegal in the past and subsidizing union dues. These are great ideas. So I know that a lot of people are going to be enthusiastic about your campaign. One more time, before you go, tell us where we can donate, what we can do to help support you, and whatever you want to end with. Uh, make your pitch, man. Okay, got it. Um, well, the number one thing you can do is you know follow me on social media and uh, you know just keep an eye on my campaign. You can also go to Joshua2020.com. We need an army of volunteers, and like we need we have we have hundreds. We need thousands. And if you sign up there, I promise, you know, we will reach out to you and we will have something you can do for us, whether it's uh, even if you don't live in in Washington, you know, we will have phone banking, text banking events and just generally keeping in touch with the with uh, our campaign and, uh, you know, helping us get um, in touch with the media and and actually get people to cover our race. And that has been, you know, a, a huge help from, you know, what I've been doing on Twitter. Um, and my Twitter link, uh, or my Twitter handle is, uh, Joshua, the number four Congress. So it's Joshua for Congress. Um, and yeah, so that is what people can do to help. Um, and ultimately our, our ideas, I think that is the most important about the thing about this, you know, I'm, you know, it, it's a meme, you know, uh, um, Dave Rubin, <laughs> he loves to talk about ideas, but my brain is still in recovery mode from taking in so many high level, important ideas. I really am someone who's about ideas. You actually have do have ideas, of, so. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of really good ideas, a lot of plans that are, you know, pushing the, the Overton window to the left where it needs to be. And, you know, just follow us, uh, you know, follow this campaign, sign up, and, you know, we will actually win this race. And, uh, you know, if you want to be part of that, uh, again, it's Joshua2020.com. Well, look, you've dunked on Dave Rubin now, which you get bonus points for. You've dunked on Ben Shapiro. I mean, What's not to like? So Joshua Collins, 10th Congressional District of the state of Washington. Uh, Good luck. Hope to see you back on the show. And we'll be following this because I think that, um, you know, Denny Heck, a lot of people know he's a corporate Democrat. And I think that as time, you know, continues on, people are getting more and more frustrated. So I hope that, you know, you can be the catalyst to get him out. So good luck, man. Thanks.